Hello. Hello. Hey, everyone, welcome as you're joining here. We're going to give everyone a few seconds just to sign on and make sure they're ready to go, and then we'll get going. Awesome, great group. Great group. Hello, Jordan. Well, hey, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the Trout Club of the Cleveland Museum of Natural History this evening. We appreciate you all, all joining us. Um, I see some folks that I know are, are members and some new faces. So if you're interested about membership, please uh, please let us know. We'd love to have you in the mix. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to Jerry Darkus here to introduce our speaker, Jordan. But first, I just wanted to remind everybody that I know we're virtual, but in the past, uh, we used to have bars that we had set up at our um, presentations and our speakers. So um, I got this beer tonight, just uh, <laughs> really just to show that I have the coolest coaster uh, at the meeting. But um, uh, everyone have a good time. Enjoy yourself. Jerry's going to give you some uh, more tips on how to communicate with Jordan here throughout the night. Otherwise, sit back and enjoy. So uh, great to have you. And thanks again, uh, Jerry. All you, man. All right, thanks, Kendrick, and uh, hey, thanks everybody for, for sitting in tonight. Uh, I see a number of people that I know and recognize and a number of uh, uh, new folks too, so we appreciate you, uh, you know, joining us tonight. So this is the first time I, I met Jordan about five minutes ago, something like that, uh, you know, uh, virtually here, uh, but uh, I have heard from her from uh, one of our members, uh, Jim Dykes, and uh, so we're very happy to have her uh, with us tonight uh, for a presentation on the Cuyahoga River. And it's not going to be fishing focused, uh, but it's going to have a lot to do with, uh, I think, some good things that are, are happening on the river. And it's becoming much, much better, you know, for outdoor activities uh, in general. And, and Jordan is a Ph.D. Uh, student or working on your PhD in ecology at Kent State University. Uh, I think that's correct. And she's been involved with the uh, uh, Cuyahoga River uh, Area of Concern cons uh, Committee for a number of years uh, and has done some studies on, on the river. And uh, again, we're very happy to have her here. Uh, you can use your chat. Uh, you know, you can type in questions uh, if you want. I, uh, I know uh, Jordan said she'll take a kind of a break. She's got two sections here and she can answer questions in the middle or we can uh, take questions at the end. Uh, the only thing we ask is that, you know, during the presentation, if you would, uh, you know, keep everything on mute and uh, so we can, you know, focus on, on the presentation. And at that point, uh, thanks everybody. Thank you, Jordan. And uh, Bob, let's uh, get rolling. Thanks again. All good, over to you, Jordan. Feel free to kick us off. All right, I'll share my screen. Well, first, thank you, Jerry. And thank you everyone for having me. I'm really excited to talk about the Cuyahoga River. And I see some names on this participants list that I recognize, so that's pretty exciting. All right. Okay, so my, my talk is titled The Cuyahoga River. It's going to focus on the Cuyahoga River, obviously. Um, I also have my email address. If you think of any questions or, you know, want to talk to me afterwards, feel free. So a little about me. Uh, I did my undergrad at Cleveland State studying environmental science and biology. Um, and now I'm at grad school at, at Kent, as Jerry was saying. And so I want to preface this with I'm not a fish person. I'm not a fish expert. Um, I actually study algae, so base of the food web, and how algae are um, how algae respond to nutrients primarily. So, um, but but I do have a pretty solid understanding of rivers and lakes and just aquatic ecology and how it works in general. So, so that's mostly what I'm talking about. So a little overview. I'm going to talk about river ecology, what watersheds are. 
Um, and then I'll, I'll take a break and then we'll kind of switch over into Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga River specifically and talking about the AOC program and all of the awesome things that are happening on the river. So what is a watershed? Many of you probably know what a watershed is or have heard of this term, um, but just to get everyone up to speed, um, a watershed is all of the the land, all of the area that drains into a water body. So if you look at this picture, this is split into two watersheds. On the left, you have a more suburban slash urban watershed. Um, so if, if it rains in this area, all this water is going to drain into the stream. At the top, you have the headwaters. At the bottom, you have sort of higher order stream. And then uh, on the right side, you have another watershed. And one thing you should notice is what happens in the land influences you know, what's going into the water. So if you think about if it rains in these two separate watersheds on the, the right side, you have more agriculture. Um, so you, you might have some nutrients running off those fields, but you also have a lot of riparian vegetation, which I'll talk a little bit more about, but you see all these trees that run along the side of the stream. Um, and that's really important for stream health and for what goes on in the stream. Whereas on the, the left side, you have a lot of probably impervious surface, which will influence how fast water gets to the stream and, and what's in that water. So just kind of a preface for what I'm going to be talking more about, but that's the gist of a watershed. And I love this. This is from Regional Sewer District. This is how our water system works. So uh, just to give everyone sort of an overview of that, we pull water from Lake Erie, it's treated, makes its way to your house through a bunch of pipes. You use the water, the water that leaves your house gets transported through pipes to a wastewater plant where it's treated and goes back up to the lake, um, sometimes to a river first, usually to a river first actually. Um, and then you also have storm water. So you have storm sewers that, um, you know, drain anything that, any water that lands on an impervious surface, so that's any surface, surface where water doesn't penetrate through it, it just runs off of it. Um, it collects into pipes. Sometimes those pipes go to wastewater plants, but oftentimes they just go straight to streams, which is um, something that is really important when we're thinking about the health of streams and what's going on in them, because um, as I'll talk about soon, stormwater is really important. Um, so what influences water quality? When I think about water quality, I think about what's dissolved and what's suspended. So things that are dissolved in water, and I guess I should preface this with, those are, I guess, operationally defined. So dissolved is really anything that we can't just filter out. Um, so anything that's less than like 0.2 microns is we classify as dissolved. Um, but generally the things that we're concerned about what's dissolved is oxygen, right? So thinking about from a, a fisher person's perspective, oxygen is really important for your fish. You also have nutrients and pollutants that are pretty important for what's going on in aquatic ecosystems. And then what's suspended, so you can have turbidity. Um, turbidity, if you think about any water you've ever seen that looks really brown, um, so maybe like after a storm when a stream is, has a lot of suspended sediment, that's turbidity. Um, but you can also have plastics. I'm not going to go into plastics too much, but um, that's kind of a growing area of concern, a, a field of research that's studying the, the role of all the plastics that we're adding to our ecosystems. And then another thing that influences water quality is temperature. So temperature is pretty important. Um, one reason it's important is because it influences the amount of oxygen that can be um, dissolved in water. So cold water can hold more oxygen than warm water. So when we think about what influences water quality, um, we want to think about what's influencing, you know, what's going on in the water, the temperature of the water, some things that do that. Um, so I'll talk pretty extensively about dams later and the dams on the Cuyahoga River, but dams in general lower um, DO or dissolved oxygen um, for a number of reasons. First, dams are bad because in general, they, they change a, a river system to a system that's more like a lake, right? They prevent fish, pass, fish passage up the stream. Um, but they also, when, they, when dams do that, when they stop that water, they um, cause this water to heat up generally, more so than, a, than moving water would 
naturally and that heating up ends up producing um, the DO that can be stored. You also have just um, generally uh, uh, water quality diminishes behind dams. Um, and because the habitat has changed dramatically, you, ha you lose diversity. Dams in general are really bad for rivers. Um, and then another thing that influences water quality is you know, um, wastewater plants. So wastewater, it's really good that we treat it because if we didn't, we'd have really poor water quality. Um, when we treat our wastewater, we remove a lot of the contaminants, the turbidity, all the things that are suspended in it. Um, in general, the water coming out of wastewater plants is so much better than the water going into them. Um, but you can still have some contaminants coming through wastewater that's not that aren't treated for. So things like personal care products, um, you know, anything that you know, med medicines that like ibuprofen, you can oftentimes track through wastewater plants and through effluent. Um, but in general, wastewater plants are incredible. We need them and we should be, we should all be very thankful for them. And then another thing that I want to touch on with influencing water quality is stormwater. So like I say here, stormwater introduces chemical cocktails, um, but that's just the tip of the iceberg with stormwater. So um, if you think about everything that's on a road, so all of the you know, the dust that comes off of our cars, the oil, everything that accumulates on a road that all gets washed into our, our stormwater systems and eventually makes its way into our aquatic ecosystems. Um, so that's where the chemical cocktails come from. But you also have a lot of thermal energy from um, hot pavement. So especially during the summertime, you can have a lot of warming of the water entering a stream when it runs off of uh, impervious surfaces and enters through stormwater pathways. And there was one more thing I want to touch on with stormwater. I'm sure I'll think about it eventually. Um, okay, moving on. So if you look at this map, this is a, um, a cycling map of the greater Cleveland area. But what I want to point out is this is a really good map to show the development. <laughs> Uh, in the Cuyahoga River watershed. So all of the area that's more red is more heavily developed. Generally, generally areas that are more heavily developed have more impervious surfaces. And then as you work your way out into the pink areas, those are still developed, but have probably less impervious surfaces. They're still not natural. And then our green areas are more natural, natural areas. But this just shows the extent of how much we've changed our, our watershed. And um, I think there are, there are a lot of consequences to, to doing that. Okay, so some of the con consequences of stormwater. This picture is was taken uh, this last fall. It was, I guess, late summer into fall. Um, this is Chippewa Creek and Chippewa Creek has a very developed watershed. And this was, I think, a few days after a, a pretty big storm. So you can see how turbid the water is, how cloudy and murky it is. You can also see how high the water came along the in, into the floodplain along the, the side of the stream and just how much power it had to push down all of these, all the vegetation along the side of the stream. Um, so developed watershed, stormwater. Um, it, it increases the velocity of the water. So as you pipe water into a stream, it, it gets there a lot faster than it would naturally, right? So you have water, more water than normal, moving faster th through these systems, which has a lot more erosion potential. So it can wash away these the sides of streams a lot more um, than you know if there wasn't a ton of stormwater entering. It also cont uh, contains some contamination from the, the roads or the surfaces it was on before it made its way to the stream. Again, the turbidity, the cloudiness, the temperature. And one thing that uh, Northeast Ohio is blessed with is, you know, our lovely weather and the things we have to do to deal with it so we can still drive in our roads, which is uh, salting them generally. So you have a lot more salt, which increases the conductivity of this water and has a lot of cascading effects on um, on an ecosystem. And one thing I should mention too with this is, um, so this stream is, you know, 
this really exemplifies the importance of your repairing vegetation. So this stream responds to stormwater better than a stream where it's not connected to its floodplain. It can't just flow over its banks. Um, streams that can't flow over their banks tend to erode even more. So example of that is right here. Um, if you've kayaked the Cuyahoga River, you've definitely seen something like this where you just have a ton of erosion because when the water rises, it just cuts into this further and further and it, it erodes the side of the stream. It doesn't, it's not connected to its floodplain where that energy can be dispersed along the sides of the stream into the floodplain. Um, and that's really bad because then you have all of the sediment that's then being carried down the stream. Um, and sediment generally is really bad for the health of a stream. Um, I'll, I'll talk more about that. But just to, to give you an example, so this is from this last fall. Um, and this is on the Cuyahoga River. So USGS has gauges throughout rivers throughout the United States. They measure um, something called discharge, which is basically the flow of the water. They also measure gauge height, so the height of the water in a stream. Um, but if you look at this graph, it's on a log logarithmic scale. Just note that, but the base flow of the stream is around 200 to 300 cubic feet per second. Um, whenever you have a big storm, it shoots up dramatically. So it goes from about 200-ish cubic feet per second to almost 13,000 cubic feet per second. That's a lot of water very quickly moving through these systems. Um, and that we uh, is termed flashiness. So when the, when the hydrology of a system changes that rapidly, um, it's called, it's, it's a flashy system. It's a, a symptom of a lot of urbanization. Um, and then that, you know, that flow, you know, starts to de decrease as the storm passes. Um, but you can see every time there's a storm, you see this huge spike in the, the flow. And this was uh, an exceptionally large storm we had. I think I actually took that picture shortly after the storm. And then this is our gauge height. So the stream goes from being normally around three, four feet up to over 20, which is just absolutely crazy that it, you know, it, it increases that much. And that, again, is a symptom of having just so much developed area where, you know, your watershed is so developed, the water makes its way to the system so much faster. And um, it's it spikes how much water is there and you get these flood-like conditions very quickly. So what does that look like? Um, so this picture again was taken shortly after that storm. This is actually the canal um, up near Rockside, right next to the river. And you can see just how dirty these the leaves are. The water was up to that level and carried a bunch of sediment up that high that was deposited on the leaves. That's at least like four or five feet above that current level, which is was elevated to begin with. So um, stormwater can have huge effects on streams. That's that's the whole gist of me talking about this part of the talk. Um, and then, so the importance of habitat, what does that stormwater do to habitat? Um, so when you have water that rushes through streams a lot faster than it normally does, you have a lot more erosion. You also just wipe out the habitat that was there. So. Um, a healthy stream has a natural sinuosity. There's generally a, a riffle run pool sequence where you have areas where you get reoxygenation from the, the riffles. Um, you, you'll have runs that also help to reoxygenate. And then you have pools, which are great habitat. And throughout this, this sequence that's um, pretty normal to, to most streams and rivers, you have a lot of space, a lot of different areas for um, different life stages of organisms to thrive. Um, and again, repairing vegetation helps with that a lot. So I mentioned earlier, or I showed you a few pictures of repairing vegetation, but um, one of the functions of repairing vegetation is to stabilize the banks, but it also can provide shade that covers the stream and um, reduces the, the temperature of the water that way too. Um, I think I have a picture, yeah. So. I'm gonna talk a little bit about food webs. But first I wanna mention the effect of sediment. So when you have all that sediment running down a system, you get a lot of it deposited, right? So as soon as that water slows down, the sediment falls out 
it deposits or it lands and the bottom of the stream covers everything. And you get, um, you get this film of sediment that covers all those crevices where you would have generally a lot of macroinvertebrates, bugs leaving, living. Um, and that's really the, the base of, you know, kind of the base of your food web. So when you have this, um, this sediment, it's called embeddedness. You have generally a less healthy bug community. So you would have less, um, they're generally called EPT taxa. So you have ephemeroptera, uh, which are your, your mayflies. You have plecoptera, which are your stoneflies, and then trichoptera, which are your caddisflies. And these bugs are really important for the fish that everyone loves to catch, your trout. Um, they're also just, you know, they're, they indicate that, um, you know, when they're present, they indicate healthy conditions. When they're not present, it indicates that there's something wrong. And generally, you won't have a lot of fish, or you, you, you won't have a lot of um, predator fish in a system because there won't be the underlying food web to support those predator fish. They're, they won't have the resources they would need to thrive. Um, so I guess to, to go over this again, if you have a healthy benthos, so you have a, a system that doesn't have a bunch of embeddedness, it doesn't have a bunch of sediment that's just covering everything. Um, so if you, you know, if it doesn't look like this, <laughs> then you can have a a system where there's potentially healthy bugs. Um, so the bugs that then feed the fish and overall, you know, support a, a more diverse food web. Um, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna pause for just a minute. Does anyone have any questions so far? Okay, so this is a picture of, let me move this real quick. This is a picture of West Creek, which is a tributary to the Cuyahoga River. And it's a really good example of a little bit of a run and then a riffle and just really nice habitat in a stream system. And this is my dog, Zoe, but I'll move on. Again, does anyone have any questions before I move on? I believe someone asked one in the chat. Oh, okay. Sorry, I can't see the chat with uh, screen sharing. Can someone read it for me? Yep, I'll, since I typed it, I'll uh, share it with you here, Jordan. So when you were showing the gauge chart before, I think a lot of us are used to um, uh, obsessively looking at those charts for uh, whether or not rivers are fishable, but what would a gauge chart look like or what would a typical gauge chart look like of a healthy river? I mean, is that, sim would it look similar? Would it look totally different? Or are we getting close to something that's healthy? Um, so it would not look like this. <laughs> it would, uh, so see how it kind of trails off on the, the backside, there's a slow decline. In a healthier system, that's what it would look like on the front side. You would have a slow build and it wouldn't, it wouldn't spike as rapidly and it probably wouldn't get as high. So systems that have a ton of development because there's so much impervious surfaces, there's so much water that's just rushing to these systems. It's literally piped there, right? Um, it, it spikes a lot faster. So yeah, you would expect, you know, if you go somewhere where the ecosystem or the, the watershed is mostly forested or is mostly vegetated, you would, you would expect to see more of like a, a slow, a slow increase up to that instead of that dramatic spike. But that's not to say, so you could have, you know, in a, a, a mountainous area, you know, where there's maybe a lot of bedrock um, or just a, a really sharp topography, you could still see spikes like this, but it still would be classified as like a healthier system, you know, but that's not Northeast Ohio. Northeast Ohio in general is relatively flat and this is not due to topography or to bedrock. This is due to impervious surfaces. So Jordan, on that front, <clears throat> just, you know, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on this, but uh, it seems like you're indicating that this is sort of occurring because of development and, and uh, you know, expansion of the city. 
Mm -hmm. it, do, do rivers adapt to this sort of thing over time? Like it, as this becomes the new normal, do they just figure out how to survive, the ecosystem survive under this condition? Well, um, not exactly. So it, these things generally don't solve themselves. Um, and that's where restoration becomes really important. So reconnecting streams with their floodplains is one thing that can really help. But, um, you know, I would say that in general, like the, the things that live in the streams, yes, they do adapt, but they, do, they don't, it's not that they adapt. It's just that everything that lives there is what's, what's left. It's what's capable of living there at that point. Um, you know, once it, once a stream is so degraded, it doesn't have the dissolved oxygen, it has too much contamination. Um, what's left is going to be the super tolerant organisms, the things that, you know, don't need great conditions to, to survive. They can survive pretty much anywhere. Um, so I wouldn't say that that's adapting. I would just say that that's kind of, you know, that's, that's what's left when you don't take care of a, a river system. Um, yeah. And, Maybe, you know, thanks, Jordan. Yeah, yeah. And one thing too is, you know, the thought on water control or water, um, yeah, I guess water control over the last 50 to 100 years is to get it off your property as fast as possible, pipe it and get it out and, and you know, drain it, release it, get it out as fast as you can. And that's really, you know, that mindset is what has led to uh, hydrographs that look like this because we're really good at draining water and getting it into a stream as fast as we can because we don't want our roads to you know we don't want um our houses our roads things like that to flood so we we pipe it away as fast as we can but then this is what happens to our our streams so so i'm, I'm hearing build a rain garden in your backyard right yeah yeah it's that's my last slide actually okay. <laughs> <laughs> um and there you know there's some other bigger scale solutions too that i'm going to talk about so Okay, any other questions before I move on? All right, without further ado. So transitioning into talking more specifically about the Cuyahoga River or, or the Crooked River. So classified as the, the, or called the Crooked River because it starts way up in Geauga County, dips all the way down to Summit County and then comes back up to the lake. So it really is a very interesting shape. Um, and this graph shows all the different subwatersheds to the Cuyahoga River. Um, and then it also has the, the main stem depicted there. So Burning River, a beautiful resource. Just 50 years ago, this is where we were at, which absolutely blows my mind um, that, you know, the Cuyahoga River, River was literally on fire and just, you know, it was awful 50 years ago. And I think we've made a lot of progress, but it's, uh, it's scary what we can do to our, to our resources if we don't take care of them or don't pay attention to them and appreciate them. So what came out of the river burning was um, many things, you know, the, the Clean Water Act, but also this program called the Areas of Concern. So it's an international program, Canada, the United States, and it identified 43 different areas that were um, substantially degraded, um, either mostly due to industry or just, you know, extensive development, urbanization in areas, but all these different areas were identified as being, you know, areas of concern. They were, they're very degraded. They had a lot of issues. And each area of concern was given its list of beneficial use impairments or BUIs. And the Cuyahoga uh, River had all of these to begin with. So, you know, various restrictions. Um, and basically each BUI is, is an issue that the river has specifically. So the AOC program's goal is to re remove these BUIs, right? Um, so to do that, you do various restoration or um, mo yeah, mostly restoration projects, but you have different initiatives to improve the, the whatever the BUI is to try to remove it from, from that list. And right now, so as of today, the, B, uh, the Cuyahoga River has had three BUIs removed. So 
Uh, those include the restrictions on fish consumption, the public access and recreation impairment, and then the degradation of aesthetics. And again, to reiterate that, those are the three. They were removed over the last few years. Um, and aesthetically, you know, the Cairo River is much better than it used to be. It's not burning. Um, it's, you know, people actually like to use it now, so that's great. Um, and then accessibility wise, the Cuyahoga River was just deemed a water trail last year, which means that um, there's a lot more, there, there's a huge resource now. If you wanna go anywhere on the river, there are maps that show you different access points, um, gives you areas where um, you know, it's easiest to get to. And also there's a lot of information about um, what the river's like in that area. So if you wanna go and paddle or if you wanna get down to it, um, if there's anything that's dangerous, they'll let you know. This system is really great. And it's um, overall just, just really great that the Cuyahoga River was deemed a water trail. And if you, I don't know if you've seen any of the signage, there's also a lot more signage that goes along with this. So I know I live in Kent and I'm, let's see, really close to this area where my cursor is. And if I walk down, there's actually signs that say, this is Tannery Park. You can put in a canoe here and you can go all the way to, um, into Akron if you want to. And then the restriction on fish consumption was also removed. So that basically just means that the fish in the Cuyahoga are the same as the fish in the Ohio or in the other Ohio rivers. It doesn't mean that you can just go out and eat as many fish in the river as you want. That's definitely not a good idea. Um, it just means that the fish in the river are at the same baseline contamination level as fish in other, in other rivers. So you still need to follow those consumption guidelines. Um, but that's, that's really a huge accomplishment because considering the Cuyahoga River is really truly a working river to have fish that are that you can eat, even if you can't eat a lot of them, it's, it's pretty impressive. And then how does the river stand today? So the next BUI that will probably come off this list is the eutrophication and undesirable algae BUI. So eutrophication or excessive nutrients in an ecosystem and then undesirable algae. So if you think of like harmful algal blooms or um, some ecosystems have a lot of like filamentous algae that can clog up rivers and make them um, very undesirable to, to be in. I'd, so the, I guess I should preface this, the Cuyahoga River that was given this BUI primarily because of blooms that would happen in Magador Reservoir, which is kind of connected to the Cuyahoga River. It's um, really truly not connected to the Cuyahoga River at this point. Um, but I can tell you from being there pretty often, I paddle there all the time, actually, there are not blooms there. There is not a, um, an undesirable algae issue. There's actually a ton of macrophytes or big plants in the water that suck up most of the nutrients. So you don't have undesirable algae growing there, which is great. Um, so that BUI is, is next to come off this list and really because it didn't belong in the first place. Uh, beach closing. So. We still have a lot of beach closings and beach closings happen because there's excessive E. coli or um, just high bacterial levels in general. And a lot of that comes from stormwater, but a lot of that really comes from combined sewage overflows. So you've probably heard of those, but that's when you have a sewage system where your stormwater um, meets up with your, your wastewater from your residential houses and um, it all flows to the, the wastewater plants, which is great, but those wastewater plants only have so much capacity to store that water and to process it. So if they run out of capacity, if there's a huge storm and they have a ton of water coming to them, they can't process all that water, so they have to release it. And thankfully, the um, Project Clean Lakes and Rivers through Regional Sewer District, there's been a lot of work to make these giant tunnels or these giant storage facilities for this wastewater. So when we have a big storm, we have these combined sewers piping that water into these big storage tanks instead of releasing it. So this is what a overflow would look like in the past. And um, you can see some of these 
giant tunnels are online now, which is great. They're storing water and then we have more that should be online in the future. So hopefully Northeast Ohio will not have a, a combined sewage overflow issue in the future and that will solve a lot of our beach closing issues. And then the other beneficial use impairments that are being targeted is um, degradation of the fish populations, fish tumors and deformities, degradation of the benthos. Again, that's kind of like the, the bottom of streams, right? And then that loss of fish habitat. So some ways that those are being targeted is all the dam removals. So there was the Kent Dam removal around 2005. There was the Monroe Falls Dam removal, I think in 2007. And dam removals dramatically improve the habitat. So it restores a flowing system to a flowing system, right? This is what the Monroe Falls dam removal area looks like now. So it's a you know free flowing system. There's no impediment to fish going upstream. Um, you can see this these really nice riffles that introduce oxygen back into the water. And the Ohio EPA is really good at monitoring the, the effects of dam removal. So this is from before. So I guess I should preface this. Um, these are some of the, the indices that the Ohio EPA uses to uh, measure the health of rivers. So QHEI, that's primarily for habitat. ICI is primarily for macroinvertebrate or bug communities. And then IBI is primarily for fish. And they'll go out, they'll measure, they'll take a ton of measurements and then they'll calculate um, these indices. And if they meet their levels that they've deemed um, for this type of habitat to you know, be healthy, um, then they get either part, they either get non-attainment, partial attainment or full attainment. And previously to the dam removals, most of this area in the middle Cuyahoga was in non or partial attainment. And now, it's mostly in full or partial attainment, um, which is really big. So if you look at all these number, all these numbers, like the QHEI, the habitat, all of them increase dramatically. Um, and when you have better habitat, you can have better bugs. When you have better bugs, you can have better fish. Um, so you really see a bottom-up effect of removing these dams. And if you want to read more about this, I included a link to the EPA report there. Um, <laughs> not the most concise reports, but they have a lot of really useful and really interesting information in them. And then you also have the um, the dam removal in Cuyahoga Falls. So if you're familiar with the Sheraton Hotel or that area, that's where the dam was. It's now a free flowing area. We have kayakers that come from all over the world to, to kayak down this area because it's a pretty steep part of the um, Cuyahoga River, which is where the city gets its name from, Cuyahoga Falls. Um, and I believe once the gorge dam is removed, this area will be Olympic trial grade whitewater. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, and then the most recent dam removal is the Station Road Dam. So that's the one in the National Park. It was just a, a low head dam and that's fully removed as of last year. So you can actually paddle through there now, which is really beautiful. Um, but all of those dam removals are helping to um, solve these BUIs, so improve the fish populations, um, fix the benthos, and um, overall just improve the fish habitat too. So, and then some more initiatives to further improve the benthos and the habitat. There's the habitat for hard places. So like I said, we all know the Cuyahoga River is a working river. We have the shipping channel, and the shipping channel is a really hard, um, you know, very structurally intensive area. It's very deep. So um, to a small fish, the shipping channel is difficult. It's difficult for them to get through. Um, so to, to help with that, they have um, put in these cages that serve as habitat along the edges of the river. Um, it's supposed to serve really as like a refuge for these, for smaller fish trying to get upstream or downstream to kind of hang out in and to protect them from the giant ships and their, their blowers that can blow them around in the, in the river. There's also the Scranton Flats project, which is a Metro Parks project that added really nice riparian area along the river and really nice habitat for fish. 
Um, and again, this is in the, the shipping channel area. So um, in an area where there previously hasn't been very much really nice habitat for fish, there now is some really nice habitat, which is really good. And I know that um, there's been a lot of fish sampling and looking at the fish in this area and the, the diversity has increased tremendously. So that's, that's really great. And then what's coming next? So the Gorge River, or the, sorry, the Gorge River, uh, the Gorge Dam, the largest dam in the Cuyahoga is really the, the big project that will um, probably lead to the Cuyahoga River being uh, removed from the area of concern list. Um, so it's, this is roughly an $80 million project because there's so much contaminated sediment behind the dam. Um, and that's just from years of people, you know, being able to dump whatever they want into the river. So uh, as that happens, you have just contamination that builds up and that sediment actually, you know, all of that sediment has to be removed before the dam can be taken out. And that sediment has to be treated basically like hazardous waste. So it's very expensive. That's where a large portion of that 80 million comes from is handling that sediment. Um, but hopefully this dam will be out in the next five years. Um, I know the city of Akron just received a grant for around a million dollars to continue the planning process and really hash out what's going to happen with that sediment, who is going to be doing the dam removal, um, you know, and just the logistics of the process. So, um, but again, you know, getting the funding to remove such a large dam is difficult, um, especially during a pandemic. I imagine that doesn't help with getting government funding to do things like this. So. Um, hopefully in the next five years, this will, this will no longer be a thing. And then uh, the Summit Metro Parks just bought a giant chunk of land that's going to be connecting Cascade, um, the Gorge Metro Park and Sand Run. So it'll be, I think, 1700 acres of continuous land with about 150 miles of trails. And what's really important about this chunk is as you can see, it, it runs along the river and it's gonna be really great protected um, area along the river. So to, when you have protected area along the river, you have protected riparian vegetation. Um, you also just have a protected you know, part of the watershed where you're not gonna have um, you know, bad storm water coming from that, from that section. But overall, this is, this is really great for the, the river's health. And just you know, the people of Summit County that live in this area, this is going to be a really great um, connection to the the other parks. Okay, so like I said, what can you do? As you see, the the background picture is a, a rain garden. But um, to start with, so the Cleveland Metro Parks has a really great watershed volunteer program. Um, so that's a that's a really good way to get involved to go out get your hands in the dirt, to actually do projects that help improve the watershed and then help improve the river. Um, there's also a, a large educational component to that program. Um, and then just staying informed and talking about the river, making people aware of it, um, appreciating the river, voting with the river in mind. You know, you can donate to restoration initiatives that are um, trying to, you know, conserve the area around the river, conserve the natural areas we have so that um, we can maybe slow down some of the development and, or at least make development that um, handles its wastewater or handles its stormwater. And then, um, like I said, reducing your impact near watersheds. So using rain barrels um, you know, on your own property, reducing the amount of stormwater you're contributing to the system. Um, so rain gardens are really good for that because they can trap a lot of water and if they're used extensively, that's a lot less water that is immediately going into the river or making its way to the river really fast. So that's all I have. Um, does anyone have any other questions or comments? And if there's anything else in the chat box, I'm really sorry, I can't see it. My screen shared. Nope, as of right now, nothing else in the chat, chat box, Jordan. Uh, what about COVID in the water? 
yeah, there's actually people at Kent State studying COVID in the water. Um, so you can detect COVID um, in wastewater. And generally, you can detect a signal in the water that, um, so if, before a breakout happens in a specific area. So I know on Kent's campus, they're measuring COVID in the wastewater from different dorms. And then if they see a spike in the, mm -hmm the level of the virus, the abundance of the virus in that water, they can um, assume that that dorm is probably about to have an outbreak and they can um, make their quarantining process, they can start quarantining early, they can um, hopefully be on top of it. But yeah, COVID can be in water. In general, I wouldn't worry about it too much in the river. Um, you know, it'd be very dilute if it was in the river. And, you know, I think I don't know. You, from what I understand with COVID, you generally get COVID from inhaling it. So unless you're like really like just drinking a bunch of river water and it happens to be contaminated, I think that would be the only way you'd maybe get it from the river, being in the river. I don't think that that's probably something you need to worry about as an angler. Hey Jordan, in the, uh, you know, in the park, they used to recommend not canoeing or kayaking during the summer. Uh, is that still kind of the same situation or is, you know, uh, is that, sounds like that's probably better than it used to be? Oh yeah, no, I, I'd say it's the exact opposite now. I'd say that they encourage you to canoe and kayak and enjoy the river as much as you can. Um, okay. Especially Great. with the river being a water trail now, there's a ton of access points and it's definitely encouraged to, to you know, float the river, enjoy the river as much as you can. All right. Hey, Jordan, we've got a couple of questions <clears throat> coming through the chat box right now. So Matt is asking, uh, do you see any problems in the upper Cuyahoga system from aging se septic systems and leach fields? Oh, yeah, there's so I haven't studied it personally, but I know that there is definitely an issue with aging septic systems. Um, I don't know specific areas of the upper Cuyahoga, and I'm sure if you looked at EPA water quality data, you could figure out areas where that's more of an issue. Um, but leaky septic systems are definitely a problem, especially when there's not stream setbacks and those septic systems butt up to the stream. Yeah. Uh, additionally, we've got another uh, question from Christopher. <clears throat> uh, he says, or he asks, uh, when the gorge dam gets removed, do you think steelhead will be able to make it all the way up to the headwaters of the Cuyahoga? Secondly, is there pushback uh, for the dam removal from groups that like to paddle or float further up the, the Cuyahoga, like the Burton area? I don't think there's any pushback for the dam removal, at least none that I've heard of. Um, you know, if anything, people are really excited for the dam to come down because the whitewater paddlers will be able to go through there. And there's some pictures of the area before the dam was there, and it's really beautiful. I mean, it's um, there's definitely a huge change in topography there. So it's kind of like a waterfall system in a way, but it's really beautiful. It's going to be great once it's gone. Um, I don't see why paddlers, you know, if, if you're not a whitewater paddler, you're probably not paddling in Cuyahoga Falls. So that's probably not going to influence, you know, the general kayaker at all. Cause yeah. Um, and then as for the, the first question, so there's still a huge impediment being um, what's just right, right upstream of me, the city of Akron's drinking water reservoir. Um, why is the name escaping me right now? Lake Rockwell, sorry. Lake Rockwell is probably not going anywhere, at least not anytime soon. So there, you won't be able to go all the way from the mouth of the Cuyahoga up to the headwaters because of that. Um, but the steelhead should be able to get, I, I would think the steelhead could be I would be able to get up um, the area once gorge the gorge dam is removed. So there'd be a lot more um, tributaries to the Cuyahoga River that they'd be able to get into after that. So potentially a lot more fishing area. Because I, I know a lot of the trips to the Cuyahoga River downstream of the gorge, a lot of them still have like waterfalls or smaller dams that inhibit fish tra uh, travel up through those tributaries. So even if it's a natural impediment, it's still an impediment. Um, Fair enough. 
Thanks, Jordan. We, we do have two more questions in the chat, but I want to open it up in case anyone is uh, asking or thinking of asking in person. No? Okay. We'll, uh, we'll go along with the chat. So, uh, you know, Matt also uh, had a follow-up question. Uh, he says, uh, are there any plans that you know about to help alleviate the dead zone? and add more dissolved oxygen to the water in the lower river. Sorry, um, not that I know of. So you, I imagine you're talking about the shipping channel and the dead zone that can happen in there and the benthos. Is that, is that what you're referring to? Oh, sure. He gonna... said yes. yes. Okay, yep. yeah. Yeah, not to my knowledge. Um, I, I mean, to solve that, you could maybe add some sort of aeration system, but that would probably pretty be pretty expensive. Um, and the, the shipping channel is, it's a necessary evil. You know, it's, we need that so that we can have all of the commerce and all of the, you know, the industry on the river. Um, so it's, you know, we can, we can try to keep it as clean as we can keep it and we can try to create as much habitat along it as we can, but there's going to be some issues with it that you just, that are going to be really difficult to solve. And I'd say dissolved oxygen is probably one of them, especially in the, the deeper parts of it. Cause it is, you know, it's, is it 25 to 25 feet at least it has to be, that's pretty deep for a river system. I mean, for the Cuyahoga River, cause it's, you know, not a huge river system, but. Um. We, we've got another one here. <clears throat> and I, I personally love this question. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you know the answer, but uh, why were the dams put there in the first place? Uh, so there's a lot of different reasons. Sometimes it's a water supply for a different industry, for very, you know, various industries. Um, so I know like the Kent Dam was put in for, there was a grist mill in Kent that the water was used for. Um, I want to say the gorge dam was for energy purposes. I'm not 100% positive on that, but there's a variety of reasons why dams are put in mostly for industry or, en or energy. Well, that, that's all we have in the, in the chat so far. Does anyone else have any questions for Jordan? Well, I mean, she's uh, she's provided lots of contact information uh, on from from my perspective. Thank you so much, Jordan. This was an amazing presentation. I found it very helpful um, and, and appreciate the time you've given us today. Kendrick, Jerry, I'll hand it over to you uh, if you'd like to kind of bring us to a conclusion here. Sure. Thanks, Bob. And, and Jordan, thanks again so much. We really appreciate the presentation. Um, I know I learned a, a good deal there, so thanks for sharing that with us. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, either from Jordan, we can help connect you to her uh, or about membership or the Trout Club, please reach out to myself or Jerry. I'll leave uh, emails there in the chat box. Uh, so that's all for me. Really appreciate you guys. Thank you. Uh, Jerry, if you have anything else, go for it. Uh, no, just I just want to say thanks, Jordan. Uh, and again, thank everybody for, you know, sitting in tonight. Uh, we are going to uh, uh, put this up on our YouTube channel. Uh, it'll, you know, if you have anybody that know anyone that couldn't make the program tonight or want to look back on a few things, it'll be up at some point next week, hopefully. Uh, so, you know, you'll be able to review it if you want to. Uh, but uh, thanks again, Jordan, for, for a really good program. It was uh, super interesting and I'm sure everybody enjoyed it. So uh, thanks again. One, one last thing before we bring it to an end, uh, shameless plug for the club here. Uh, next Wednesday, we will be doing our second round of our tying series, uh, covering the perhaps infamous uh, woolly bugger uh, and some variations on that. So if you are interested in tying or learning about it, um, this is a great uh, first pattern if you've never done it. Um, you know, at, at least to dabble in the, uh, into, the, into the concept. So uh, please look for, look for the link for that. Um, we can make sure we get that distributed out to 
you know, the email list and, and up on the Instagram page. We'd love to have you, whether you're a tire or not. Um, and yeah, have a good evening. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.